I love Rankin and Kings so freaking much, and the treasure chest of courage definitely lived up to my expectations. I wasn't sure at first. The first few episodes was like, this is nice. This just feels like, you know, let's see Boji having fun, Kage doing some random stuff. Not much significance here. But as the series went along, I realized just how important this sequel is. Now granted, it's not necessarily a sequel, it's technically they are adapting things that were skipped with the first season's adaptation. And honestly, things around issues that I had with the first season. Despite the fact that my thumbnail when I first reviewed the first season, I called it a perfect show. It wasn't necessarily a perfect show. There was tidbits here and there where I thought, why has Beb been doing that? Who is this on girl? <laughs> And honestly, it was for a reason because, yes, with the first season's adaptation, they decided to cut certain storylines, which, honestly, at this point, looking back, I'm like, why did you do that? But it's okay now, because now we have Treasure Chest of Courage, and whenever I tell people to watch the first season, I can say, well, just make sure to get a watch list so that you know when to insert <laughs> episodes of Treasure Chest of Courage. It was really, truly a beautiful series, and I love the first season more so because why I call it a perfect show was because... The character writing was so freaking good. Like, the writing, their characters are dynamic. They have multiple reasons for why they're doing things they're doing. They can change their minds about certain allegiances and whatnot. It's just so freaking good with character writing. And honestly, with Treasure Chest Courage, it just compounds on that and gives me so much context to the characters themselves. I now understand why Dida truly does love his brother. I now understand why Bebin lost to Apius. I understand why Bebin helped Kage. I understand all these things that I was really questioning. But now what kind of cemented it for me, what really made me go, oh my gosh, I need to make a video on the Treasure Chest of Courage despite the fact that it's just adapting unadapted stuff, is the final episode. The final episode finally got me. And for those who don't know, I made a video a while back when this first season was airing, some part later in the season, I made a speculation video where I was really diving into what is the Ranking of Kings system. It's the title. It seemed like the show itself was straying away from that. It opens up with it. Every king is trying to be the best ruler ever so they can get the highest ranking in the Ranking of Kings and they will be granted a wish. That's the core story concept. But again, it just kind of went after Boji. Okay, if Boji's out of the kingdom, he's doing his own thing. Forget the Rank of the King system. But what I mentioned in that video was that the Rank of the King system has never been put to the wayside. Instead, it was sort of explaining through other character stories what the Rank of the King system was. Getting into Bose and his backstory with Miranjo and everything like that, it was telling us how it came to be. This idea that the gods themselves were essentially being overthrown by mages. At some point, humankind started learning magic, magic that was only for the gods, and they started to rise up against the gods. And at some point, the gods fought back, they destroyed the mages, they were like, yeah, they're done for. But their focus shift, this little brief scene, it mentioned the idea that the gods were deciding at that point, we need something else to sort of control the humans. The day and age where we can just show brute strength isn't gonna work anymore. We need to find a new way. And that was my speculation back then. That was probably the birth of the Rankin of Kings. And thankfully, with this new adaptation, this new season, we sort of got answers to a lot of things that I wasn't really expecting. Again, I was just expecting it to sort of tell the same stuff over and over again. So before I get into that stuff, I wanna put a big warning here, big spoiler warning for those that have not watched the first season. If you haven't, please go watch it. If you want my review, yes, 100% go watch Rankin of Kings. It is an amazing series. And yes, try to find a watch list that tells you when to insert Try to Chest of Courage episodes in there because I think, again, there's a lot of context there that I think is sadly missed. But no, the, especially the 10th episode. My gosh, the 10th episode was so fantastic. I love this. It, and now there's a tragedy here, obviously, and it's the idea that Desha finally goes to get his reward. He ha he is the most powerful. He has reached the top of the ranking of king system, and so they're going to give him his reward. So he goes to this place that is guarded by golems, apparently, goes inside there, and immediately, Desha isn't dumb. Desha is not your typical king. He immediately sees all this stuff and goes, meh, whatever, and eventually sees the thing that everybody chooses. Now, my theory that I had with the first season was that the the gift, the thing that was going to be the thing that everybody chose was immortality. Obviously, with every king, they have everything they want. 
So the Rankin King has to give them something that they can't find anywhere else. And again, that's my theory is the gods gave them essentially things that they cannot obtain by normal means. And so my thought was that it was going to be immortality. And that every king chose, chooses immortality because you can't, no, no king can get immortality. Their only weakness is their mortality. And so I thought that was to be the choice. But apparently it wasn't. <laughs> apparently it was a sword. A sword that has runes upon it that are divine. Which again, symbolizes that these are from the gods themselves. Because this is divine writing. And typically divine writing is from gods. And that this writing, if they could figure out what it's saying, will grant them any wish. Which would be immortality, obviously. Or is my speculation. And so all the kings choose a sword. And the trick here, and again this played into my theory. How do you control the kingdoms? as a god, if you don't do it by brute force. You give them something that makes them go mad and thus destroys themselves. And thus nobody will get strong to the point where they overthrow the entire world. So it's a reset. That was my theory is that, that the Rankin and King system is built to be a reset. Somebody gets the most powerful. They award them the title of the best Rankin and Kings. And they go in here and they get something that will drive them mad and destroy themselves. That was what happened with Kingbo. That was what, that was one of our examples. We've seen how Kingbo was this king that reached that point and destroyed himself. This is saying why. Every king chooses the sword. And the sword itself, Desha knows immediately that it's cursed. It's cursed because the moment it hits air, oxygen, the outside world, it decays. And they don't want it to decay because they want to read it. So... How do they keep it from that? They have to put blood upon it. And so that caused them to go around and just take out everybody. Which again explains why Kingbo did what he did. He started killing people. So that explains what is destroying all these kingdoms when they reach that point. But then it gets more interesting because again, Desha says, no, I don't want this, it's cursed. And the guy says, oh, Desha could be the person who actually solves the mystery behind the Ranking of Kings. It gives an indication that this guy wants somebody to figure it out. He's being used. It gives you an indication this guy is being used just like what it seems like the people within this chamber. So he's brought to the back. And that's where we find that they are actually keeping demons inside there. They call them gods, but they're technically, for most people, they signify as demons. And he mentioned the idea that every god has a role that they can do. And it seems like these particular ones, these demons that what they look like, sim similar to the one that Miranjo knew, that they are able to grant wishes, but at the cost of their youth. And so they see one, he looks like he's dead. <laughs> and they show this other one, it looks like a child. And he presents them, this child can grant your wish. They'll lose their youth, but they'll grant your wish. And as per usual, we know based on Desha's mentality, he's a... He seems like a bad ruler. He did some really terrible stuff in order to stop his father, but it was all for the purpose of creating peace and removing sacrifice. And so even in the face of this moment, I can just take this child's youth and I can save my brother. I knew he wasn't going to do it, but it seemed like it gave you that indication that he was. And it wasn't until Oaken actually comes there that you realize, oh, he didn't take that child's youth. He did something else. And that's when we find out that a little bit later, after Oaken's restored, find out that he's actually human. He can't eat rotting flesh anymore. <laughs> big, big emotional moment there. Uh, even, even having Despa tell him, look, none of this stuff is your fault. Which, yes, is technically true. It was his father. It all leads up to this moment of sort of realizing that it seems like, again, Desha sacrificed his memories to save his brother instead. That it seemed as if when Oaken arrived there and just basically forced his way in, took out all the golems, went inside the inner chambers, met these people that are within there. He immediately walked back out. Like he realized something. You see this brief shot of these people in there and they're crying, implying that he probably went in there, said, what did you do to my brother? Where is my brother? Where is Desha? And they probably told him at that point, he sacrificed his own mind to save you. And it made them sorrowful. Again, it implies these people within this chamber are not the gods. They're basically being used just like this guy that goes around and checks everybody and brings in the kings. They're all being used by this system. And that's why they want them to uncover this system. To eventually find out, again, my theory, the gods created the system, placed them here, had somebody go out and bring them in there, 
just to create the cycle of destroying the most powerful kings. It's a really cool idea that throws in there and I'm kind of glad that my theories around this was actually true. Because on one end, it shows you that this ranking of king system is destructive. It shows you that the people involved don't seem to want to be involved. But technically the idea that Desha, despite the fact that he was given this reward, he chose the best route that doesn't sacrifice people to save his brother. He gained his wish, but at the same time still played into the system. The system still created a tragedy from it. Like he said, he's no longer the king that he once was. The system still got its sacrifice. But to his terms, I think, is the important thing here. Desha is smart. He's a very smart dude. He didn't play into the system. He became a sacrifice to the system, but he didn't play into it the way that they typically have them do. Which again, is absolute self-destruction with sacrifices involved. Again, Kingbo, his entire kingdom slaughtered for the sake of the reward that he got. Desha, it was just himself. Only myself am I going to give up. It, he's such a good character. I, it is. It hurts me more that Boji and Kage just went right past him. They do say there's other people out there that look just like you. Oh, no, that was Desha. That was Desha. Now, I will admit that there's one thing in the 10th episode of Treasure Chest of Courage that technically throws a wrench in my theory that the rank and a king system is created by the gods to destroy the humans and keep them from getting too powerful. And that was the arrival of the god that fights Oaken. It sort of gives an indication when Oaken first arrives that, oh, well, the guards out front are really powerful. So whoever can actually get past them is really good because they're, the guards are golems that essentially are powerful enough to give a god a hard time. Now that comment didn't really ruin it because yes, you would think that the gods themselves would create something to guard the place and make it as powerful as something that they could barely face, or at least something that would give them trouble and thus would give humans a lot of trouble. But the fact that when Oaken leaves, it sort of gives this feeling of like, oh crap, the god arrived and is mad that its golems are destroyed. But no, the god's like, good job. Are the ones inside destroyed too? And Oaken's like, no. And then he goes, okay, well, I'm gonna go take them out. And that's what makes Oaken fight the god because he believes this god's gonna go inside there and destroy the ones that are inside. Also sort of indicating that the ones inside are golems as well, question mark. But why would this god, if the gods created the Rankin and King system, be going in there to destroy everything? Unless possibly he is a faction within the gods that's trying to fight the other faction. It technically indicated that he was fighting alongside Desha at some point. So he could be wanting to destroy the Rankin and King system because he favors the humans over the gods or at least wants to overthrow the other gods. But again, the indication this could be giving that ruins my entire theory is that the gods themselves did not make the rank and a king system and thus they want to destroy it. Possibly there is a third faction here. You have humans, gods, and then a third faction that wants to help the humans gain power, or at least find somebody that is worthy to take down the gods. And possibly they're bringing each one of these kings in, each one of these fantastic kings, to eventually find the one that can find the treasure in there, gain strength from it, but not be destroyed. Which would indicate this idea, this overall story of wanting eventually Boji to go in there and find something and not be corrupted by it enough to have power to go up against the gods. But no, that's... Again, the only thing that's really kind of throwing that wrench in there, but again, it kind of is explaining the idea that there could be a god that's just trying to destroy the other gods, or at least destroy their their system, which sucks because we don't really get an indication of what he was doing there. And so we're not going to have those answers until maybe we have a scene with the gods and one of them says, yeah, did, did what happened to blah, blah? Oh yeah, they were destroying the the rank of the king system, but some, it looks like somebody handled it. Additionally, the guy that goes out and sees all the kings, he says specifically, we're not your enemy. He tells Oaken, you know, we're not your enemy. Which, yes, could imply that they there are not bad guys. It's just that they're a part of this system. They're being forced to do this. But again, it could be the idea that, no, we're trying to find kings that are worthy and that won't be corrupted. And that could also explain why they were crying. They could be crying not because Desha was so selfless, but the fact that because he was selfless, he was so close to what they wanted so close to the person they were looking for. And then he still sort of failed. Now, if it is a third faction, my prediction is it's specifically the Homa kingdom. The people that the humans betrayed, the ones that were learning magic and rising up against the gods. 
It's probably that group, and that would explain why this one god just going out to find the remnants of them and destroy them. They were left to survive. Like, they didn't wipe them all out. They just said that they're doomed. So this would explain why, you know, there's this group that's trying to help the humans. And that would explain why they don't care if the humans, <laughs> the king goes corrupt and everything. They're like, whatever. The humans, the other humans betrayed us, so what do we care? It would also explain why, specifically, the guy that was about to stop Oaken was about to pull out a wand. It looked like a wand. But no, Oaken is the big thing here, though. Because honestly, and it's the entire season, this entire Treasure Chest of Courage is, has been the nugget I wanted. If anybody watched my videos when I was doing the first season and I did a lot of impression videos, the thing that was still egging at me was like, I want an Oaken redemption art. He is like the most tragic character in the entire story. And I'm like, I want a redemption art for him. They literally left the first season with him losing his head <laughs> and he's all tied up and everything. I'm like, I want this dude to have redemption art. And we got it. Like, we got the original origin stories, the moment that he actually changed, which his father possessing him because he had immortality, his descent into madness itself, being captured, his friends trying to help him, his brother, everybody trying to help him. Desha, Despa, was it friend? Everybody trying to save Oaken. And to have this last episode where he finally is restored again, based on his, his brother just sacrificing himself, was just so freaking emotional. Everybody's so happy to have him back, only for him to run right into tragedy. I like that he actually restored. I think he's still going to have this sense of, I caused devastation, I killed so many people. But I think, again, it's, it's sort of gonna have Despa relaying to him, no, that wasn't you, that wasn't you, you did nothing wrong except for being really crappy with your sword. <laughs> he just gets onto him about how terrible his sword play was. But yes, eventually having him take on a god, which is, was super crazy. I, I loved how they put that in this idea that, uh, was it Desha told him, if you ever face a god, run. Like, don't even bother. Don't even bother getting, they're, they're too powerful. And again, they sort of give that hint with the backstory stuff. Not that they are immortal. They're not like these all-knowing beings, but they're powerful and they've always controlled people, but they're still mortal. And that gives us the indication here. He technically beats this god. It's through what Desha tells him. Throw them off. Make them think something else. To put their guard down. Which again, he just <laughs> wets himself. Put their guard down and then strike. And it pulls it off. But again, it was a great little wrap up. Again, it kind of leaves on a tragedy in the idea that Desha is just out there in the middle of nowhere. But at least gives me closure on Oaken. It gives me closure on so much stuff. And yes, even, like I said, answered a lot of questions I had. Like, it, Bevan's episode was so cool because we got to see why Bevan did what he did. Again, this was context I was frustrated with when I was watching the first season. Why did Bevan let Kage go? And why did he give him this letter to go to Despa? We find out why. Bevan was the weakest of the, the great four. He fought and fought and trained and trained, eventually training with Despa himself, just like Boji does eventually. And then he learns his own skill, learns how to manipulate things to be as strong as everybody else. But it explains why Later on, Oppius beats Bebin. If I had this context, I would know exactly why Bebin lost to Oppius. Oppius has always been more powerful than he is. But additionally, again, it explains why he helped Boji. Boji is just like him. Bebin was never as strong as the others. And just like him, Boji wasn't as strong as his brother. Yes, he's good at dodging, but he wasn't as strong as him. So it gives the reason why Bevan would be like, okay, well, if Boji wants to be like me, if Boji and my, and technically his serpents were all supporting Boji as well. Eventually he realized, okay, I'm gonna send Boji off to become strong just like I had to. It explains why he knew Despa and why he sent him there. It's really cool. I love all the stuff around Boji being king, Dida being king, him wanting to live up to expectations of his brother, try to be a great king like his brother, which was fantastic. I love that one brief scene that he runs in the blind man. I was like, that's a great callback. For those that don't remember, Way back at the earlier segments, you had that moment where Boji and Dida were walking around and Dida didn't understand why you would help this blind man. He finally helped him. <laughs> you see how Dida has changed. Also seeing how Moranjo is trying to change the way that she's doing things, going to see the grave, making an orphanage for the children. It, it's just a lot of context around the characters that just, it fills in the gaps. And man, learning that Dida knows healing. I never even realized that. <laughs> Dida learning healing from healing. It was like, wow, I would never have guessed. But again, it's another one of those things that sort of connects Dida with his brother. He loved Boji. He wanted to protect him. He wanted to help him. Despite the fact that later on, 
the the power of being a king itself sort of ruined that whole thing, he still did love Boji. Eventually learning how to heal and saving Boji's life. Which yes, technically makes sense because he's a son of healing. It would make sense that he would know how to cast healing. I don't know if it's blood related. I, just, I, I assumed that it was blood related. That's why Bose chose healing to begin with. Anyways, I can go on and on and on. I absolutely love Ranking of Kings. I was hoping that we get an announcement for a second season. Hopefully we get one soon. I don't even know if they have enough stuff to start to get into. It just really did feel like this later part of the season was technically trying to nudge a little bit further into further content. Uh, which was a nice little icing on the cake at the very end of it, but I, I just can't get enough of it. I hope we get more, but uh, anyways, that's my thoughts on Reckon of Kings, Treasure Chest of Courage. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as always. If you did, make sure that like button down below, comment, let me know what's thought of this series. Additionally, if you're new to the channel, make sure that subscribe button to get my content. I do news reviews, first impressions, top list, if it's anime, it's pretty much here. Additionally, if you want to support the channel more, I have a Patreon link, tips link, super thanks, and membership button down below. Greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel. You guys mean so much to me, and y'all take care.